starting with the order of battle. I know there's a great number of resources available, certainly on the internet, with varying degrees of detail. But really what I was going for was numbers per core, per division, total numbers of guns and cavalry, anything I could get that was basically roughly representing these large division size formations. So I pulled together the numbers that would represent each of the cores. So here for the Austrian army. And I also tried to take note of the types of forces involved. If there was Landwehr or, or Hungarian or other nationalities, I knew I was gonna to wanna to know that for purposes of the, uh, the presentation on the labels later as well as um, the headquarters and command that would be involved with each of the leaders. So when I had those numbers, and, and they kind of checked out from source to source, I then tried to figure out how they would break down in terms of blocks. I ended up going with 4,000 infantry per block and 2,500 cavalry per block and about 38 guns per artillery block. Now, if there was a case where it was kind of in between, like here in this first division of the advance guard, I tried to round up a little bit if I thought it would advantage a side or just represent the branch a little more accurately. So here, you know, this division is just large enough that I didn't think it was appropriate to have only a single block. So I thought I'd break it into two blocks giving the Austrians the benefit of the, uh, the doubt. That's, I might go against the history a little bit in the sense that the Austrians had these really huge regiments that might not have been as flexible as the French, and perhaps only having a single block could represent that. But it would also make for kind of an unbalanced game. So I decided to, to err on the side of balance over you know strict adherence to the numbers. But as I went through and I, I did my little bit of math and tried to divide these things out to make the blocks, I kind of liked the way it, it worked out. It felt like the army was going to represent what was there, but also sort of what it was capable of doing. And in the end, when I got to all of the possible blocks, I kind of liked the way it looked. You know, 34 infantry blocks, seven cavalry, 15 artillery, plus the HQ and command. It just, it looked like it was gonna cover the map space that I was thinking of covering and, and be playable. After coming up with those um, breakdowns, I also had to look at things like the cavalry, the, the branch of the cavalry, heavy versus light. I also wanted to see about um, the type of unit, be it elite, for these heavy cavalry and some of the grenadiers or militia, which is just a representation of the lesser capable units in pub battles. So anything that was lawn bear, I wanted to make sure they were represented as a piece, as an individual block, so I could have that effect present in the game. So there is a bit of lawn bear in the Austrian army, but a whole lot of standard sort of veteran forces. Not a lot of cavalry. Of course, the same thing was done for the French. Came up with the best numbers I could, filled in the gaps where I had to, and then used the same you know, ratio of 4,000 infantry for block and about 2,500 cavalry. Now, sometimes I rounded up a little bit or sort of just you know, made it look correct. Like I wanted to represent the two divisions of the guard, even though maybe strictly speaking, it doesn't, reserve, it doesn't deserve an entire block. Maybe this heavy cavalry doesn't really deserve an entire block, but I wanted to make sure they were represented. Other places I rounded down, but otherwise I just try to keep straight to the um, to ratios and come up with as many of the pieces as I could represent. Doing the same thing, looking at the cavalry for their branch. Now here's a case for the Army of Italy where I fudged a lot. I mean, the strict numbers for the Italian Guard are very small, barely worth one block. But I just wanted to make sure I represented 
the infantry and cavalry that was present, even though it might be a little out of um, out of range for its particular effect. It just had a nice um, balance that it offered to these pieces in this side. And the same thing went with the Bavarians here of the Seventh Corps. They probably merit one block, maybe two, but I went ahead and made them, you know, an infantry and a cavalry block to represent the forces that were present. Now the the Saxon army, they're not militia per se, but this militia effect in pub battles just represents lesser quality troops. And I wanted them to represent the way the Ninth Corps fought that day, which wasn't very good. So all of the Saxons are listed as militia. Most of the heavy cavalry for the French are at elite. That gives them a pretty powerful force there, but I think that's probably appropriate for the way they functioned. I also threw in the, <laughs> the Laveau Island garrison. Uh, I probably should have skipped that, but I just like the idea of making sure that that was a target for the Austrians. So when I totaled up all the blocks, I kind of liked it. It looked like it was, you know, representative of the forces, but also it was slightly more than the Austrians, which was pretty historic. With an order of battle in hand, now I can make up the labels. The pub battles has already established in other games that the French blocks are blue, the Austrians are white. So now I need the labels to fix to those colored blocks. Uh, I'm pretty cheap. I went with my favorite graphical design tool called paint.net. It is open source free, uh, pretty simple, has some plug-in capabilities to give it some features. Uh, free, did I mention that? So that was probably the biggest concern for me, not spending any money. But it has the ability to create layers and then compose those layers into a composite, a, a single graphic. And so that's what I was going for. So the first thing I did is I made a, a new graphic. It was exactly the right size for the label. This is approximately 1.76 inches in uh, breadth and about 0.25 inches high. And the idea would be that I would fill that space with the label color and then any uh, text or overlays that I needed to represent the pieces. So I created a whole bunch of layers with the different colors that I wanted to represent. So I used different sources from the internet to uh, get ideas for the for the uniform colors and different colors that might you know, represent the particular forces. And then I just you know, made simple solid colors out of them. Italian guard, Saxons, and then I played with different, different tones, different hues, because I knew I was going to have to do a color test to figure out what would actually print out right and look good. But everybody had a different kind of color scheme, Austrians and French, Bavarians, Baden, Hungarians, all, all, all manner of colors. And the idea would be, would be that I would pick a, you know, a color, here would be for the Austrians. And if it was infantry, I would put the text over the top of it, be it black or white, depending on the background color. And then I could just type the text and I would have my piece. But sometimes there are um, overlays for it, such as for cavalry. It's this wedge, red for the French, blue for the Austrian. And depending on the branch, there may be another vertical or you know wedge line, dragoons or heavy cavalry. Other overlays include the elite um, the icons. These represent the elite forces, and I just snatched those off of pub battles scanned other uh, labels from other games and use those directly. So the idea being that then once I found the colors I wanted for each of the units, I would pick the background, I would pick any overlays for cavalry or elite, and then I would 
take the text color and type up the text and therefore I had my, my label. Now before I printed out labels, I actually did a color test sheet where I put all of the possible colors and different gradations to see which ones look the best. And after printing that out and making my choices, I went ahead and started to create my labels. So here's an example of the labels for the Austrians. I started out by making a page that was eight and a half by 11. I'll hide these layers. I always like to draw a little border to make sure I have sort of constrained myself to a reasonable printable area given some margins. Then I did a grid. These would be all the labels and then the square blocks for headquarters then the circular for the command chits. And it turns out there are just so many pieces I can't fit both armies onto one sheet. So what I ended up doing was one sheet for the Austrians and one for the French. So basically I just looked at my OOB and I started to make backgrounds appropriate for the particular pieces. So for straight Austrian pieces, it would be the gray. Lon Ver would be this tan, Hungarian, the blue. That's largely the colors for the Austrians. Now, here I also have a headquarters chit, and this is supposed to be a gold background. The color test for this was terrible. So even though I, I went ahead and designed all these with that gold background, they, did, they didn't look good at all. But then I did my overlays for like my cavalry. There's not a whole lot in the Austrian army, but when I had to do heavy cavalry, dragoons, light cavalry, and I got those overlays on them. And I finally finished it off by putting another um, layer and typing in all of the unit text, the, the formation, the division, and then if there's more than one piece for that division, that's generally represented in pub, battles, pub battles by L and R, left and right. Militia, I went ahead and put the M on them. All the artillery, there's the artillery overlay for the circle. And then there were the elite overlay for those forces. After I finished all that, I then did the headquarters. The headquarters I did as a separate graphic, much the same idea. It is a, um, these are 3 8 inch, and I did a full um, set of overlays. Again, I played with a lot of gold colors trying to find what I liked. I never did. I still came up with the concept of being able to have the overlays. This would be Napoleon's specific side of his command chit, his headquarter chit, I mean. And then the others would roughly have a gold background and then the name. And it could be the leader name and then the leader formation that he's commanding. Since Carl, Charles is the head of the army, he doesn't have a formation, but others would have you know, first core, second core, and so on. They also have these flags representing the fresh side of the headquarters shit. Uh, I chose the French flag poorly. I think this is too late in the era for uh, Wagram, but I think the Austrian one is appropriate. And I use those overlays to construct um, the final headquarters chits as seen right here. So I have squares for the flag and then for the specific side of the units. And of course the command chits are pretty simple. It's just a circle and the formation text on it. And of course I did the exact same thing for the French. Now the French um, have a little bit more color involved. They have the guard, variants, 
Saxons, Italians, some, I think those are the, I think Hessian or Baden, I can't remember now, but anyway, some German forces there, and then a whole lot of cavalry. Same thing with their command, excuse me, their headquarters chits, the little squares with the background and the flag, as well as their command chits. But, you know, I was not at all happy with this gold for the guard and for the command chits. What I ended up doing was something a little different. I ended up creating another design that was all transparent. If I get rid of the background, there is no background. My thinking was I would print these on transparent label paper and then use a metallic gold paper behind the transparent labels to get the full gold effect. Well, I did do that. I'll, I'll show you how I did that later. But I think it turned out really well. A lot of effort, but um, it made the headquarters and the guard really pop. Now, once I had my labels, I could create my graphical orders of battle. So the first thing I did was I created some 3D looking blocks to represent the pieces. You know, this would be a, a combat unit, a headquarters in white and in blue for each of the sides. Um, I also did a quasi 3D looking circle for the command chits. Then I created a massive mass of blocks on a new background. So I created um, 11 by eight and a half, put my boundary around to make sure I stayed within my printable area. And then I put all the blocks on. So I had to play with, of course, how I was gonna lay these out because the number of blocks and the number of forces were never gonna be able to fit on a single page. So I tried to come up with something I thought was, you know, close to ideal. And I laid my blocks out, just blank this way. Then I put an overlay with the unit labels, which I pulled from the um, the label the piece the label pieces I had for each side. And I put those and laid them out. Now, as I tweaked the order of battle once or twice, of course, I couldn't help myself. I had to lay this out, and then I'd think, no, I got that wrong. I got I need another piece here, which made it a mess for me to have to go and rearrange all these blocks and labels. Very time intensive, but you know, I wanted it the way I wanted it, so I was willing to do the work. And then you know, finally I just put some simple text titles over it so that when it gets printed, it'll look basically like that. So I did that for the full armies on both sides, all the pieces, the French, and their allied armies. So in the end, those did come out looking the way I wanted. A lot of effort, but I think it was worth it. And the map is a pretty massive beast. The source material was pulled from the internet, from some archives on the internet. And they come in all of these individual pieces. So they had to be pushed together and spliced together to make a coherent whole. Interestingly, most of these are at the same scale, but two of them are at a different scale. So not only did they have to be scaled to pub battles, but they had to be scaled against each other as well. So what did I do? I used paint.net to make a massive single sheet piece together bit by bit from all those uh, map resources and then put together in individual quadrants. Sort of like the Northwest, Southwest, you know, so on. They had to be pieced together pretty specifically and then scaled to pub battles. You know, at a high level, it looks okay. Going down, it kind of gets a little dicey. But basically, that was pretty good a good starting point and a good way to piece this together. And it gave me my 
reference for sort of estimating the area I wanted to use and then doing my uh, essentially a sort of quasi play test with this as the the map in a virtual sense. I couldn't print it just yet, but I could get a feel for how the blocks would lay out and present on the map of this sort. I tried very unsuccessfully to use this as a reference for a hand-drawn map. And boy, I just didn't have any luck. I don't have any skill in that area. So what I decided to do was to pick the area I liked, which is something kind of approximately in the middle, and then crop this image to that size, and ended up using that as my map for the game. This was my secret weapon for creating the blocks. Originally I tried to take dowel rods like this. This is a circular dowel rod I used to create the command chits. Similar square dowel rods I used to create the blocks. I tried to cut them by hand with a with a with a you know free handsaw. And that was pretty miserable. Um, I just couldn't get this cut straight at all. They were always crooked and I was trying to sand them into place and never worked. So finally I broke down and I bought this little hobby saw. It's got a half inch cut, which is just, just right for these particular blocks. So I would take a dowel rod like this, you know, just mark it with a pencil at exact intervals for all the cuts I want to make, and then feed it through this little thing. And it's completely manual. It's got the little jaws of life there to Set the thing in place. I'm not going to fire it up because it's kind of shrill and no one wants to hear that, but and just cut through one at a time. And then advance it to the next. Cut one after the other after the other. It was pretty inexpensive, not exactly mass production ready, but more than good enough to have good straight cuts on all the blocks. Took a couple of hours to get through them all, but you know, put game of football on in the corner and get yourself cutting and it's over before you know it. So after all of that cutting, I end up with a lot of naked pieces of wood like this. Very smooth. I do go ahead and sand them after I cut them, make sure I took off any edges, and any possible imperfections in the wood itself. So now I have a bunch of these, and they have to be painted. Oh, and of course I'm going to have headquarters pieces that are, you know, a little uh, half inch and then the, the uh, command chit pieces as well that are the uh, half inch as well. No, these are three eighths inch, excuse me. Three eighths for the blocks and the headquarters, half inch for the command chits. Now the internet is full of really good advice on how to paint. That's where I picked up these tips. So I'm not going to try to replicate that. But what I found was if I use a paint box, just a, an old cardboard box, that was a really good way to sort of keep things connected and uh, contained in one area. So I could lay out as many of the blocks as I could inside of the area and then, you know, follow the instructions, shake until your arm wants to break off, and then smooth passes. You know, not too much, um, not too much coverage to make sure that it was... Um, smooth but not a lot of run because then you end up with little dif difficulties where the runs to the bottom it might stick and you got to do a little sanding and clean up and that's just a pain in the neck so obviously i hit it with the white for the austrian blue for the french and then black for the command chits and this being winter in these united states my biggest trouble was really ventilation there weren't too many days where i could do it in a in a garage that was warm enough. So I, you know, had to pick my, my parts where I could get to it. So it really took me quite a while to finish the paint just because I didn't have good conditions. But otherwise, these techniques, I think, helped keep it contained, you know, keep the splatter, you know, to a minimum, and got things painted pretty quickly, pretty effectively. So after a couple of coats, get it cleaned up. What I have are some blank blocks painted and ready for the labels.
Now this is the color test that I printed. Um, one thing I wanted to do was to be able to make sure it looked okay, especially after I um, coated it with a matte clear coat to kind of protect the, the colors and the labels over the long haul. One thing I was really unhappy with was how the gold looked. These gold just, they don't look gold enough. Nothing I could do in printing would make that work. So I went for option number two. That was, I printed them on clear label paper. So transparent paper with transparent, no background image on the, uh, the labels and on the headquarters as well. And I got the gold by using a gold, very thin, metallic gold uh, poster board paper. So I cut out a block of the labels, affixed them to the gold, and then cut them out, and then glued the, the two together onto a block. I think the result was far superior to what I had come up with. This really does look like a gold background block. Same for the headquarters. See, they're slightly thick on the edge there. But they feel fine. And I got the, the really, the outcome I wanted. Of course, it was more labor intensive, but at this point, I figured, what the hell? I'm already <laughs> going overboard with this thing as it is. So these are the printed and top coated with the clear matte coating for all the labels. Units, now there are a couple that I corrected, um, but largely this is it. Headquarter or uh, command chits in the headquarter flags, except for Napoleon's there, I'm going to replace all of these quasi gold ones with the clear ones printed onto the gold paper. So how did I cut these things out? Well, I have my trusty cutter here, which I use for a lot of things. I botched several of these labels doing this. I just, damn, I had a hell of a time trying to line them up and get them cut the way I wanted. So I got rid of that one. I went with good old fashioned hand scissors. So yes, I hand scissored out all 100 plus of these things. And really that was my only option when it came to the command chits anyway. So I painstakingly and laboriously trimmed and cut exactly to shape. Um, that was one of the reasons I had the dark borders around the white um, labels here for the French because if I snipped off the black, what I was left with would be exactly the correct size for the label for the French. Whereas for the Austrian and some of the others, I didn't need a back uh, a border because they were exactly the right size and the color told me where to cut. And these are what some of the painted and labeled blocks look like. Really nothing terribly exciting about cutting out the labels and laying them down across the, uh, the blocks. One thing I know is that even after sanding and painting, you want to be careful about which side you pick to put the label on. You know, I made sure to examine all sides to pick the ones where it's going to look correct and affix smoothly. And there's a case where actually one of the corners is sticking up a little bit. And that got to be kind of a pain. Many of them would sit just nicely, others not so much. So if I found I had a corner problem, and even without the corner problem, I had definitely the gold problem where I had no adhesive backing to these, just straight plain paper. I needed some craft adhesive. So I got some craft adhesive, and it was important that I had a brush applicator. Then I just brushed the corner that was having trouble, or in the case of these uh, gold pieces, the whole piece, and then laid it down nicely. And it, end up being hearing and fixing any of the bits I had problems with.
Now the rules I just typed up in Google Docs and then transformed into a PDF. What I wanted was something akin to the single rule booklet that presented the special rules and the scenarios in order of battle, just like I would get in pub battles. Now some of the rules were pretty simple. Some I just you know wanted to make sure were represented straight out of pub battles, like the charge and cavalry rules. Um, I had to choose some command ratings for the two sides. I favored the French, as seemed to be appropriate for that battle. A couple of special things about how Napoleon and Charles work, as well as Eugene. But then I got into special rules for this game, and I, you know, I'm sure this is what development is all about. You have great ideas inspired by the history that end up being terrible when you play them. But a few stuck. You know, I chopped out some as I as I played. But I wanted to have something represented uh, Marshal Bernadotte and the Ninth Corps and how they fared. Now Bernadotte was, you know, fired that day and the effect that would have. I also felt like the French heavy cavalry or, or medium cavalry far on, on the far right side needed to be able to function, you know, far away from the headquarters of the uh, cavalry reserve. Also, I felt like the Rusback needed to be presented as a, as a significant impediment on this field, more than a standard stream in pub battles. So I, I got some, some rules there around its effect. Uh, I probably should have gotten rid of the Lobo Garrison. That's just a waste of time, but I already had the darn pieces made up, so I, so I kept it in. Um, John would have a variable arrival, his, his forces may or may not arrive, based on a die roll, and then the Austrian Fifth Corps could be an optional unit added to the scenarios. That ended up being most of my rules. Came up with some victory conditions. I felt a couple of sudden death victory conditions would be appropriate but not the big. And then the scenarios. I wanted to have a scenario that covered the main battle of July the 6th. I wanted to have one that started on July the 5th, you know, after the French crossed the bridge, saw them fight across the field. And even for some reason, I thought, well, I have one that starts on July the 4th and incorporates the crossing. Maybe give the French the ability to choose different crossing points and the Austrians that choice to defend in different areas. A couple of variants. I really like the idea that maybe the war in northern Italy dragged on and that would have uh, kept Eugene's army away from Napoleon. I think Napoleon still would have had to have fought, couldn't have sat there on the Danube forever. So it would have been interesting to see how they would how they would prosecute that battle without the large forces of Eugene. But then I did some graphical setups. Basically, I just used my reference map, paint.net, my favorite tool, and plop some, some graphics on top of the map showing, you know, roughly historical setup. I did another one. This doesn't turn out very well in PDF, I'm afraid, but where I tried to do the exact position of the forces in, in the form of the actual blocks. And then one for each of the other scenarios. Then I plopped in the visual order of battle for both armies. And I finished it off with my own take on the movement and combat effects chart for pub battles. And that's the rules. And one of my last finishing touches was picking up these these cloth bags, little drawstring bags, picked them up at a hobby craft shop. The idea is these would then contain the blocks when they were finished. They do a nice job. You know, it's hard to see, but they're chock full of blocks. They keep them protected in one spot. Use different colors so you know which pieces are in, for which side are in which bag. What about the costs involved? By the, the end, I had my fixed cost, which was the map, 
Plus, I sprang for that little saw, which made things really possible. But then every time I went and printed something, every time I had to reprint, every time I had to fix something, every time I botched a bunch of blocks and had to do it again, another trip, another receipt. So, paper labels, printing, blocks, paint, the bags, the glue, all told, it ends up being a pretty expensive homemade project. Over $150, I'm afraid to say. But, I learned a lot, and if I did it again, I'd be far more efficient, and if I make far fewer mistakes, and I'd really have a handle on how to get it done. I bet I could get that down to probably $70 in the end, knowing what I know now. So that's my pub battle scenario for Wagram. A lot of time, a lot of effort, too much money. But still, in the end, I was really glad that I went through with it and did enjoy playing it quite a bit. That said, if you ever try something like this again, I really hope someone will stop me.